Well, hello! It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. So, let's dive into it. If videos like this interest you where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And, um, I've got a couple topics including some controversy in this video, but uh, one thing, I, if you have information, I would love for you to comment on it, and I'm serious. Uh, one of the pens you are about to see is a Marshall. I have learned since last week that it's a Dutch fountain pen, probably made in the 50s or 40s or 30s <laughs> and that's all I know about it so if you have more information about the Marshall brand especially if you can give me a link I would really 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 appreciate it um, because I've got a short very uh, lacking paragraph in the book fountain pens of the world and that's all I found except for a few Marshalls for sale so yes I would welcome any information you have so let's dive into the pens Right, so these are the pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. I have a Platinum 3776, Parker Sonnet, a Parker Dual Fold, a Vitosha, a Pelican M800, a Marshall, an Aurora 88, Lamy 2000, a Rex pen, and a Schrade Tactical Fountain Pen. And kind of wild, uh, I actually emptied a whole bunch of pens this week, so... Uh, like, this is literally my entire inked up lineup right now. Uh, as always, I'll be doing my writing sample in my cognitive surplus notebook. So, my first pen for this week is a Platinum 3776 uh, Shoji. This is the first 3776 I ever bought. Um, as you can see from the links in the video description, my uh, opinions of this pen have evolved over time. It's, uh, I, I've grown to really like the 3776 model. Now, right now, this pen is filled with an ink that I'm using for uh, addressing envelopes and such. And, uh, yeah, just a pleasant writer. And this is a much more reasonable size for a nib for that purpose. I had it in a coarse nib before, and yeah, that was a mistake. So, Platinum 3776. This has a medium nib. And the ink is platinum, carbon black. I also just recently voted with this ink. Because uh, in this state we have uh, the ability to do mail-in ballots. So naturally I took advantage of that. And of course my ballot has been accepted by the county. So... Hopefully, you know, mail-in ballots get counted here. So, there we go. So, it's it's just a nice black. Uh, I wouldn't call it a beautiful color. I like it on the envelopes because it's waterproof. It's different from normal inks because it's one of those, uh, what do you want to call them, nano inks, where the particles are suspended in the ink instead of uh, being a dye. Like this next pen is a dye-based ink. So, this is a Parker Sonnet. I have two of these guys. This one is my one with the gold nib. And right now, thanks to the generosity of a viewer, I have a, a sample of Parker Quink Red in it. Uh, is it my favorite red? No. Uh, actually, the red has very little to recommend it specifically, but I do uh, appreciate the chance to, to try it. Uh, unlike the green, I won't follow getting this sample up with uh, trying to hunt down a bottle of it. But uh, I, I guess uh, last week I talked a little bit about uh, Parker Quink. 
Um, just, you know, why does Parker only have three colors? But then you think about it, like, Aurora only has, had two colors, and then they expanded it to three, and you're like, whoa, they added blue-black. And then they uh, upped it a little bit more, and they added, uh, well, a whole rainbow of colors. I got this purple here that was sent to me, along with a pen, and I don't know. <laughs> I think there's, it, it's in fashion right now to have more ink choices. You know, now that fountain pens are more of a luxury item rather than a daily writing tool for a lot of people. My next pen is a Parker Dual Fold. Uh, this one has Parker Brown in it. I took a little while off from using this pen. I'm back at it. And yeah, it still is very dark brown. I mean, if I didn't tell myself that this was brown, I'd think it was black. And the nib here is, a, I think it's a fine, yep. I, uh... You know, I can understand this. I, you know, you can see a little bit of brown to it. So it, it would be one of those understated inks where maybe you're supposed to use business-like colors at your workplace, but you want to have a little fun and push the edge without getting in trouble. I think this would be that kind of ink. This next pen is Bulgarian. It's a Vitosha vintage pen. It was my first uh, piston repair. Um... You know, it has a, drawing a blank here, blind cap to cover the piston turning knob. It has a very, very narrow sweet spot, so if I get off the sweet spot at all, it just gouges the paper. And I am actually filming this a little late this week. It's a month, or no, it's a, what night is it? Tuesday night. Last time I wrote with this was on, uh, I guess it was last Friday. And you see it started right up. So, yeah, lower quality uh, Bulgarian pen, but a very nice writer. Very good pen in a lot of ways. Uh, the ink in it is Ackermann. See, I just gouged right there. Ackermann. So I have to keep it slightly rotated. Grunmarkt. Smaragd. It's an okay green. It's nothing special. I'll, I'll be honest. The only thing that's ever really excited me about Ackermann inks is their bottles. I don't... There aren't any real colors that I'm excited about. Um, there's just nothing exciting about them except for the bottles. The bottles are awesome, though. And I kind of wonder if they had just standard bottles, like a Parker bottle or something, if they would be nearly as sought after as they are. I don't know how empty that pen is because it doesn't have an ink window, so it always surprises me when it runs empty. <clears throat> uh, this pen has a borrowed version of Parker Quink Green. Uh, my next pen has my version of it. So this is a Pelican. M800 with a broad nib and the ink in it is Parker Quink green I'm kinda glad I have this red here uh, one of the things that struck me last week was what a dismal collection of colors I had out um, it's been kind of a dismal time <laughs> I might have to talk about it one of these days, but since it's currently current events, I'm going to behave myself. Uh, more of a local thing than a national thing, although it's part of what's playing out nationally. Uh, so I that's the sample that I was given. This pen, this Marshall, has a sample that I was uh, that I have because I have well, I have two bottles of green. Uh, this pen, by the way, shows that some company borrowing the recognized 
symbol of another company is not new. This is a Dutch pen of the 1950s. Uh, that's all the more information I've gotten on it. <clears throat> so I want this weekend to film my review of it before it runs empty. And uh, yeah, I found out it's Dutch and the pen is probably from the 50s and that's it. So if you know anything more, uh, I would sure welcome any information about the Marshall brand. Especially if you can give me resources. Uh, so Marshall is, is full of, whoops, my green, which is much darker, much richer, much more shaded, and very enjoyable. So we'll call it my Parker Quink Green. My feeling on this one is just kind of a little too fakey looking. Not a bad color, just not my kind of color. This uh, almost kind of reminds me of Deatramentus Mint Turquoise, but maybe a little better behaved on paper. And I know it's not the same color, but it just kind of makes me think in that direction. My next pen is an Aurora 88. This pen is uh, another one from the 1950s, maybe even 40s. It's definitely had a little bit of fading in the weather. This is ebonite. This is celluloid. And it has just an absolutely stunning nib. Not a lot of ink left in it, so I'll be surprised if it's in this lineup next week. Maybe I'll ink up my other vintage one with something else. Something bright. I need a something bright and happy down here. So this is Birmingham Pens. Twilight. Uh, used to be called Allegheny River Twilight, but uh, now it's just plain Twilight. My next pen is a Lamy 2000. Last week it was full of Pelican Edel, or sorry, Pelican 4001 Brilliant Black. Although that's not what's in this bottle. Uh, this stuff, this week it's full of Pelican Edelstein Onyx. Because I thought, since I'm not using this up very quickly, why don't I just put something else in it? For no particular reason, just a little variety in my life. And might help me use up an ink bottle or a bottle of ink faster. I you know I like this onyx. I, I'm not uh visually if you put two samples of writing side by side, say, okay, which one's the 4001? Which one's the uh, Edelstein? I I wouldn't know the difference. But, it is a nice ink. I, I need to, I should probably one of these days try to do like a paper chromatography, see if anything sticks out between them there. Oh, you didn't see most of that. I apologize. So last week, yeah, here, was when it still had uh, brilliant black in it. So, I don't know that there's huge amounts of difference, but. Whatever. <laughs> okay, continuing in this dismal theme of inks, except for that nice bright red up there, I have my Rex pen. I don't know a model number. That's another one that would be very helpful to know more about it. This one I honestly have not used since... I mean, it's been laying here, but I have not used it all week. The other pens have all seen use. Uh, this pen is not, but I thought with only 10 pens inked up, I thought, well, <laughs> I 
I almost wrote pale blue dot. I mean, I almost wrote pens in use instead of pale blue dot. But I thought, you know, since this would be the only one I haven't used this week, uh, I'll just include it anyway. This is actually a very nice color. I, uh, as far as I can see, there's it's only the one bottle of it that's very small, that's part of the set of four. Jupiter Flyby is another one in that series that's very nice, and then the other two are just kind of meh. Can I say that? I don't know, Colorverse is one, that they, they've got interesting marketing. Uh, I love their science-themed names, their bottle's kind of cool looking. But not very many of their colors really jump out at me, and, and it could be because I have more ink than I'll ever use, and I just want to have less ink. That could be a big piece of it, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I was excited when they came out, but only ever bought that one set of four tiny bottles. So my last pen is a Schrade Tactical Fountain Pen. Uh, as somebody pointed out, that's a little more refined than your typical Schrade, or I'm sorry, than your typical tactical thingy. I, uh, I really don't remember what possessed me to buy it, except maybe the, the tactical thing was kind of cool. You know, part of that tactical thing is this whole masculine culture. Oh, oh, oh for male, I, I can survive anything, god dang it. So, uh, what makes it tactical, you've got these ribs to give it some strength. And this I see as, like, maybe you could hold it like this and pound out your window in your car if you're sinking in the water or something, which isn't as uncommon as it sounds. Uh, unscrew it. There was actually an available roller ball here also. And then you can screw the cap on, which is not perfectly aligned, but I can live with it. Because I hate it posted because it's so long. So this is a Schrade Tactical Fountain Pen. I, uh have a few days off coming up soon so I'm going to film a re-review of this I'm hoping to do kind of a post-apocalyptic themed thingy uh, when I originally reviewed it I did a zombie th themed thingy I uh, I know some people thought I was making fun of tactical culture or whatever I don't think I was I'm just looking because I cannot for the life of me remember what ink is in this pen <laughs> okay Hiroshizuku Yamaguri I must have been on a Hiroshizuku kick for a while because I bought way too many of their little 15 milliliter bottles. I'm glad it was them, not their giant bottles, but still, that's a lot of ink to get through. So I'm, I'm seeing that as kind of, and the color verse is kind of low lying fruit, low hanging fruit that I can get rid of a number of bottles relatively quickly. You know, working my way through. A puppy like this is going to take a while. Although, I have made headway on it because I've been using this one for all my first impressions videos lately. I hear my uh, voice seems to be going. I was noticing it when I filmed the intro and uh, I'm, yeah, noticing it even more now. So, uh, not sure what's up with that. Last night I was at a football game and was in the rain for a while. So, could be that. I don't know. Feel fine. So, anyway, uh, what, one of my topics I've got here, I wanted to just mention, last week I talked about how I had put the uh, new version of Evernote on my cell phone. And it was kind of nice. I hadn't used it for long at the point I recorded that. I can't remember if I'd even gone grocery. Sh oh, no, because I forgot to bring the cell phone with me. So I always put my grocery list on Evernote and then carry the cell phone around with me in the store and then I can hit the little check boxes as I pick up each item. And no, forgot cell phone because I don't carry it with me really. And uh, so I had a very expensive trip to the grocery store because that's why I make a list. So, uh, but anyway, I was liking it there. So this week I installed it on my, uh, well, I guess it would be last week at this point. 
But anyway, I installed uh, Evernote on my work machine and on my home machine. At home, I have a MacBook. At school, I have a Windows machine. So two different ecosystems, which is why some of the suggestions like using Apple Notes just doesn't cut it for me. And uh, yeah, I have to say I'm liking it. A uh, couple things are weird. Like I'm, it took a little getting used to. If, if you were to click on the link that I have at the end of this video for the high-res pictures, you're going to see thumbnails of all the YouTube videos, whereas in the video description down below, you just have uh, the links. So that took me by surprise, but apparently the links are what paste, so whatever. Uh, one thing that was a little more annoying is when I copied the link to the page and pasted it down there, it put a friendly name for it. Um, well, it called it Pens in Use October 16th, 2020, which is the name of the page, but I wanted the link there because that's what I need on YouTube. So uh, I had to do a little jiggery pokery to get that one to work out, but I got there. Uh, but aside from that, I like the... Uh, the menu bar, I think it's much cleaner. I like, you know, not having the font sizes because I'm a LaTeX guy or Licks. I, I don't like all those choices. I prefer to think in terms of styles. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I said, oh, I want a heading, not, oh, should I use a 14 or a 15 point font? I just say heading. Uh, I just say normal and, you know, whatever else they have. Um, I think... The tables, I'm thinking I like. Uh, you know, it has that new, what's it say, insert. I like that. Um, yeah, just in general, I'm liking it. It seems to be a little faster. Now, admittedly, I was using the beta version on my work machine, so that was slower than death. So I do appreciate how much faster this is. And I think Ian Small, who's, uh, I believe he's the CEO of the company right now, I think he took the right approach when he said, let's get Evernote back to basics. Let's get it doing the note thing well instead of, uh, you know, I think that for a while there they had diversified too much and were just their fingers in too many different pies. And I think going back to basics and being a good note taker, I think that's the, that was the right call. Um, and yeah, the, you know, the software looks subtly more modern, but not like, oh my God, what just happened? Type of more modern. Like you get with a, every time Windows runs an update, it seems like. Uh, whoops, did I say that? So uh, anyway, I, I like it very much. I'm very pleased with it. Um, so I may have to, I, I, a while back I wanted to do an organizational video. So maybe series of them. So I may have to do that. I've got a couple of days off coming up. I'm going to spend part of it doing stuff for me, but... And I want to film a couple repair videos and get a whole bunch of pen videos filmed in it also. But, uh, yeah, I may uh, work on something organization related. We'll see. Uh, that whole, oh, you're stuck at home because of the pandemic thing last spring. Uh, didn't work out so well with the free time. I had less, even though I was teaching online and wasn't commuting to work. So, uh, yeah. Uh, the other topic I really felt I wanted to include tonight is a much more serious topic. Uh, this, this actually is a local-ish topic. Uh, I'm going to take you to Gettysburg, South Dakota. Now, the last time I was there is about 20 years ago. Uh, so, I, you know, I remember it because I remember the sign as you drove into Gettysburg back then. It says, where the battle wasn't. Well, yeah, because it wasn't. Uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania is where the battle was. Uh, Gettysburg, South Dakota was actually settled by a bunch of Union soldiers, and I guess not very many Confederate soldiers. Anyway, it's a town of about 1,200 people, so a little smaller than the town I live in, but not a lot smaller. Um, more central in the state than where I am, but and it's South Dakota instead of North Dakota. So uh, I put three articles from... Um, the Star Tribune in Minneapolis in the video description. Okay, so, so the articles are about some events set in motion by Selwyn Jones. He's an uncle to George Floyd. You might remember George Floyd from Minneapolis last spring because uh, I think that's seared in a lot of people's memories watching that happen to a man by police. But anyway, uh, he and his wife, uh, 
I wasn't sure how to pronounce her name, J-O-I-E, so I'm guessing Joy. Uh, but he and his wife, Joy Jones, moved there in 2014. They had uh, two kids, seven and four. And uh, why Gettysburg, South Dakota? Well, because uh, Joy Jones grew up there. Her mother still lives there. And so they bought the Sage Motel, which is which had been closed, and uh, they ended up renovating it and reopening it. And it's now KJ's Inn and Suites. Not a endorsement. I've never stayed there. I uh, like I said, it's been twenty years, so Mr. Jones wasn't even a resident of Gettysburg at that time. He was apparently had a football career in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I'm curious how that works because. Sioux Falls, South Dakota isn't what I think of as a football town, but whatever. Um, so anyway, last summer, be, you know, because he's family with George Floyd, uh, a reporter, some ambitious reporter, figured out, hey, a, a relative of George Floyd lives in Gettysburg, South Dakota. And he called him with a question that Mr. Jones had never thought about before. He, he says, so what are your feelings about the Confederate flags on the police cars and police uniforms? And uh, Mr. Jones, of course, sorry, my microphone was ready to quit. Mr. Jones, of course, was like, what? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, what they did, had on their uniforms and on their police cars, they had a emblem. It was a Union Jack and a Confederate battle flag, um, kind of like this, and uh, then a cannon underneath it. And... I, I'm not ready to have malicious intent to it. I think it was somebody's idea of, well, let's honor the Civil War in a state that wasn't even a state during the Civil War. And so that's what they did. Because kind of that's their thing. There were, there were a bunch of uh, Union veterans and one or two Confederate veterans that did help found the town. So that's why it was named Gettysburg in honor of a battle where the union began to turn the tide. So anyway, he called up the mayor because in a town like that, you can do that. I mean, I know the mayor. I, she lives two blocks that way. Um, I taught her kid. But anyway, so the mayor defended it. Um, but what I found interesting is the police chief, even they were going to discuss it at city council, which is usually a way of, well, let's not change anything. Uh, but, the police chief just decided to remove the emblem. He, you know, they had these little patches with the emblem, so he had them taken off the uniforms. He had them taken off the police cars. He had it scraped off the front door of the police station. Boom! Problem solved. Which I thought was pretty awesome. Um, took all the, stole all the thunder from the people who want to make a big deal out of, uh, out of it, which this year, what do you think would have happened? But the story doesn't end there. So I'm just going to mention that this emblem had been in use for 11 years. Uh, it first appeared, huh, the year Obama was elected. But in the 137 years or so that the town has existed, it hasn't been the emblem. It's just been for 11 years. So clearly not something that's an important part of the town's heritage. Well, the artist claims there's no racist intent. I... I actually believe that. I think they were, you know, what's a quick, easy, recognizable symbol of the Civil War? Oh, let's put up the Union Jack and the Confederate flag. And, uh, but I liked what the police chief said. Because here's his comment. I'm going to read this to you. This is another thing that will be in a video one of these days. But anyway, for now, would you, and this is a direct quote, would you put the Confederate flag on your business or your home? If you are not willing to put the Confederate flag in your business or your home, then why is it being forced upon our agency? Boom. Exactly. I uh, have a big problem with that. Now, in its historical context, yes, it makes sense. But we're putting up a symbol to represent the agency, to represent the town. Uh, if we want to do a museum display about Civil War, I, I get that we would have... You know, the stars and bars there and stuff. But uh, I don't think it belongs on a uniform. It would be just like saying, hey, let's celebrate the uh, Second World War. We'll have a, an American flag and we'll put a swastika on the other side. Uh, no, that will never happen. Nobody's going to say, 
hey, that's a good idea. That'll represent both sides. Because both sides were not equal. Whoops, I just went to a new page here. Um, and, and really, who wants to wear that Confederate symbol? Uh, it, you know, remember, it's a symbol of traitors to the United States who lost the war. And oh, by the way, the great cause they were fighting for was the right to own human beings. I don't want that on my uniform. Sure as hell wouldn't want it on my state flag. And even Mississippi said, Woo! Yeah, maybe it's time to get that thing off the flag. Even Mississippi said that. Now, uh, so that was all settled back in July. Thank you, police chief, whose name I didn't write down. But uh, Mr. Jones has been continuing to get a lot of backlash over it. Because, of course, we can't let this be a Gettysburg issue. Let Gettysburg, South Dakota fight it out. Oh no, we got to bring in outsiders. So uh, they've had protests in their park arranged by people from outside and you can read their comments in the article. Uh, and some of them are, when I said there's stuff I don't want on my channel, that would be the stuff I don't want on my channel. I don't want to say it. So I'll let you read it if you want to, if you can put up with it. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I'm sure he's gotten some backlash locally. People don't like it when you stand up for something that's right. And especially right now, this has become so politically charged. Oh, and by the way, did I mention in 2015 when that whack job down in, was it South Carolina? One of the Carolinas went into a black Methodist church and killed all those people? Yeah, Gettysburg had some talk about the Confederate flag on their uniforms then, too. I see a problem there, and I so I'm glad it's gone. But he's getting a lot of flack, and yeah, when you when you take an unpopular stand, even if it's right, you're going to get flack, and people don't like flack. So I really respect him that he's got the strength to stand up for it. I, uh, yeah, this is the kind of guy who is a natural leader, and he just was mildly, you know, let's do what's right type of thing. Um, sadly, we do have that political element that's, they're erasing our history and all that nonsense. Well, well, no, we're not erasing history. We're just refusing to respect a symbol of something that was very wrong in our country. I would not expect Germany to be putting up statues to Himmler and Hitler and, you know, whoever else he had, Mende not Mendeleev. Whoever, I don't care, it's late. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't expect us to be honoring those people. Um, because they're traitors. And, sorry, I guess maybe it's because I'm not Southern, but I, I just don't have any respect for traitors. And uh, especially for the cause. I, I could get behind it if I really believed in their cause. Owning human beings isn't a good cause. So, yeah. But anyway, so i uh happy to hear that Mr. Jones is fighting for what's right. I can't imagine it's easy for him because I know what North Dakota towns are like and I can't imagine South Dakota towns are much different. I can't imagine what it was like for him anyway being in an interracial marriage with mixed race kids in a town like Gettysburg, South Dakota, even before all this. Um, I better not comment any more there now because I don't have personal experience with it because look at me, it, there's nothing mixed race here. Uh, believe me, I, that's not an experience I've ever had. But, you know, I can just imagine what it's like because I know the attitudes. So, uh, you know, my hope is he's opening eyes, but, I, you know, in this 2020 in our politically charged climate, People aren't as receptive to this kind of argument as they may have been at another time. So anyway, I just felt that was a, a story worth sharing. And uh, I want to thank you for listening. And if you want to know more about Mr. Jones, I put three links down below. Uh, I did find some other links out there, but they didn't add, they didn't feel like they added much to it. You could go try to find the horrible Facebook page that's referenced in the article in the third article, but I didn't want to read that. I've got another video I'm working on that 
I'm having to do in bits and pieces because it's so dealing with such a tough topic. It's it's going to be a driving video, and I, I'm struggling with it emotionally. <laughs> so along with all the fun stuff going on locally over COVID-19, because we're 20, what are we at? 26 cases today? Um, we're shooting up there here in southwestern North Dakota. Yeah, 26 cases today, according to my latest map. And we still, most people not wearing masks and actually hostile to it and saying that they're fake and they don't do anything uh, while kids are out of school for COVID or contact. so Or avoiding school because they don't want to get it. Because we've got that going on too. So uh, yeah, I, I've got a school board meeting coming up and uh, the fireworks should be interesting. So anyway, <laughs> I guess I let you into a little bit of what's going on, why I'm stressed. <sighs> anyway, I want to thank you for watching. And if videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens, both new and old, and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And uh, again, do you know anything about Marshall fountain pens? Because I would love a little more information, because I know nothing and can find nothing. Uh, please let me know down in the comments. Or maybe you'd like to comment on Mr. Jones. I, uh, I found his story very compelling. Uh, I don't know how close he was to George Floyd. I know George Floyd's mother is his sister. But uh, aside from that, I don't know how close he was. I know he's been involved in some of the protests, but you know, if it's family, we, I think we would all be part of that. So uh, anyway, um, let me know down in the comments. I... I always see these pens in use as more of a chance to get off topic and talk about some of these other issues. And I think race relations in our country is an important one to talk about. So I well, thank you for watching. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.